Hey everyone, welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys. Everyone's talking about AI, and today we're gonna to discuss Photoshop's integration of AI into their editing software, right after this. In May 2023, Photoshop released a new version of its software. It was called 24.5. There were some nice new features in that. I actually did a video on it as it pertains to wildlife photography. Now, what I didn't talk about in that was this new beta version of Photoshop that was released at the same time. And that is actually what most of the buzz has been about. See, this new beta version incorporates for the first time, really integrates Photoshop's AI technology. And they do that, Adobe has... Photoshop and they also have an AI technology called Firefly. And this is the first time that these two, these two softwares are being integrated together. And we're gonna show you a little bit in this two-part series, part one today being just how it works, maybe some applications for wildlife photography. In part two, we're gonna talk about the consequences of AI. And I'm gonna show you some really kind of scary examples. I'll tease one of those today for you. But let's go ahead and uh, I'll open up my Photoshop. Now, in this first image, this is a, by the way, this is a morning warbler. I caught this a couple weeks ago. Absolutely delighted. This is a very difficult bird to find in Pennsylvania. So some of you guys may jump in from the photo editing side. Some of my wildlife friends, a lot of bird photographers follow the channel. Um, but I got to just share some of my joy sometimes. I was delighted with this. The goal in camera, just so you know what I was thinking was, I, I saw this bokeh up at the top, this really nice light shining through in the morning. He was singing, kind of moved around. And I was able to compose a little bit in field. While this guy was skulky, he was actually long enough in this one position singing that I could frame him. And so when he lifted his head, that bokeh was right there. So this isn't edited. This is actually right out of camera with some very minor adjustments to exposure. That's it. So this is, you're getting the, essentially you're getting the raw file with, with a couple little tweaks. What I wanted to show you with this generative fill, this, this AI technology in the newest beta version is in today's video, how does it work? And in the next video, more about like the implications of it. Let me just show you there, there are two really practical ways as a wildlife photographer that I have found to use this generative fill where it works better than other tools that are out there. One is distraction removal. The second is stitching or moving things together or filling in blank areas. It has been exceptional at predicting what should be there from Im in an image and replacing it. Just real quickly, I want to show you how uh, two different tools work. One is called Content Aware Fill. There's a couple ways to use it. I can select an area. So I'm going to make a duplicate uh, just real quick of this file. Notice I've moved my, this is called the Contextual Toolbar. So if you don't have this version yet, uh, get used to this floating toolbar. You can deactivate it. It moves with the image. I don't like that. So I'm actually going to pin it down here. And you'll see there's an option to pin it. I'm going to pin it in the lower right corner. So that's what that contextual toolbar is. As we make selections in Photoshop today, you're going to see the generative fill option come into play because it's going to predict that that's an option we might want and it gives it to us. So let's go ahead and make a quick selection. I'm going to use the lasso tool and I'm just going to take this branch down here and I'm going to choose an option called content aware fill. So there's the generative fill. Now, I told this thing to pin down here, but I unpinned it. So I'm going to repin it back down here. I'm going to right click this instead of using the generative fill. I'm going to right click and it's going to give me all of the fill options. So content aware, delete and fill, which is a, a, something I liked in the past, or generative fill. Let's do content aware fill because I want to show you with content aware fill how it works. It's showing me in the green the areas that Photoshop is using to make the replacement of the area I've selected. I don't want the bird, I don't want the branch, so I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm, I'm allowed to, to pick and choose what I wanna fill it with. So I'm gonna fill it with this, it gives me a preview over here, I'm gonna hit okay. The, the principal factor is that it's using existing pixels. So it's taking what's there and kind of averaging them out and saying, okay, I think this is what you want, let me do it. And it did, so it puts it in a new layer, nice and neat, so I've got it there. That's how content aware feels. Let's go back to the basic layer. I'm gonna turn this off. Let's go back to the base layer. And when using generative fill, you cannot work in blank layers. So when you're doing cloning and some healing, sometimes you could create a blank layer on top and you could edit into that blank layer. With generative fill, you do have to be selected into the solid layer. I'm now this time, gonna, it's got the shortcut here, so I might as well use it. I'm gonna hit generative fill. It's now gonna ask me, what do I wanna put there? 
you don't have to fill anything in. If you don't fill anything in, it is going to predict what you want to do. And it normally re recognizes that you want to remove. So it's going to attempt to remove this and fill it back in. The difference is, and here's the primary difference. It's not just looking at pixels here. It's actually going to go outside the image and see if there's other things. So for example, if I said replace that with something else, and that something else wasn't in the image, and I'll show you an example of this later, it would go outside the image, try to figure out what it was, and then insert it into the image. So you could see Content Aware did a nice job, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Generative Fill did a nice job, and it gave me three options. So right up here, and I'll have to move this a little bit so you can see it, I'll float this out from my head, it gave me three options. So I can pick the one that looks best, and it's this one right here, and I can just keep it as is, it's done. It also created that on a new layer. So I had to select the layer that I wanted to do the generative fill from, but when it produces the generative fill, it will create a new layer for it with a mask. So we're so far so good. There's the original, there's the generative fill, and there was the content aware fill. Doesn't look too much different so far. Let's try a more challenging example now. I'm gonna go back to this, and some of you might be thinking, well, Scott, you didn't leave a whole lot of room at the bottom of this image, and you are correct. So I'm going to now add some pixels to the bottom. I'm going to use a four by five aspect ratio and I'm going to make it a little bit longer on the bottom. So we'll go from that corner to this corner. I'm going to scooch that up. Now look at the empty pixels at the bottom. I've got two ways I can fill this in. The traditional way would have been content aware. So let's try content aware fill. I'll hit this check mark. It's now again analyzing inside this image and predicting what it should fill in at the bottom. Let's see how, whoa. Well, that's not good. Um, well, that's not good at all because it used information from the image. It actually saw this area here and it said, well, if you want more, let me just give you more of it. So it gave me three bird's toes. And if you want more over here, let me give you some of this stick over here. And it's a mess. Like it's a hot mess. By the way, sometimes content aware works great in, in wide open areas without a lot of detail. If you're filling in the sky or filling in, you know, kind of a solid color, it will generally do a very good job. Let's see what happens if I do the same thing. And I'm going to take content aware fill off this time. Let's see what happens if I do the same thing with generative fill. So I'm going to create that extra space. And this time I'll use this, this is called the rectangular marquee tool. I'm going to select this area here. I'm going to select just a little bit of the image, just a little bit. I'm going to hit generative fill. I'm not going to tell it what to do. It will assume that it's going to fill that area in. Let's see how this one does. And just for comparison, I, I, my assumption is based off of my last couple weeks working with this, it's going to give me an option. It may not be perfect, but it will give me something much closer to reality. And it is going to, again, go outside of the image and replace it with things that may not have even been here in the original. Well, look at that. This wasn't here in the original, but did it do a good job? Yeah, it looks natural. It gave me three options. If I don't like that one, let's go to the next one. It looks pretty good. If I don't like that one, go to the next one. And if I don't like any of them, just generate another batch. But look what it did. It actually filled in and look at the light. The light matches, the direction of the light matches, the textures match. Even the noise pattern is really close. Now, I dig in. Sometimes I get really detailed. Um, I will tell you, it you can, it, under, under high scrutiny, you can see some differences. Where the mask is in play, you can see some differences. So you might want to blend these areas in if you're doing this. But, I mean, what a difference from the content-aware fill to this. Really, really powerful. Now, in this next example... I think this is really neat. I'm going to show you how I created this. In the field, I stitched two images together. So I knew I might want this vertical composition. So I took a, a picture of this golden winged warbler. He was singing in this tree. It was really beautiful, by the way. And then I took another picture up top and I stitched it together. What, what stitching means is it's just taking two different frames and putting it together. Often I do this to create a, a horizontal image into a vertical image with more pixels. One of the advantages of stitching is you can often get very big files. So here's the bottom frame. Here's the top frame. You'll notice that that shading, that's where I had to mask it in. And this took a little bit of time. I had to match it up. I had to get the colors right, put it all together. And when I had it all together and I did all my edits, this was the final, final result. 
took me a little bit of time. And this is somebody who does Photoshop, but it took me a little bit of time. Let me show you what generative field is. I told you the first application is removing distractions and I showed you quickly how it might add some pixels in. Let's take a look at this one now. I'm gonna go ahead and make several selections. And as I'm making these selections, I'm gonna hold the shift key. So I've made one selection there, one selection there, one selection there, and one selection here. Now I hold the shift key and all of those selections get locked in. Now let's try generative fill. In this case, I'm actually saying, I wish I had made this picture longer. So instead of stitching them together tight and overlapping, I'm gonna have this fill in and actually create a longer branch. And here's where, uh, for a lot of people, it's gonna be a struggle. For me as a wildlife photographer, I was always pretty comfortable manipulating the pixels that were there, mostly removing them. I wasn't super comfortable adding things in. It took some skill in Photoshop to add things in, but this technology, and again, I get, I'm getting options and I'm just sampling through, this technology really allows you to add pixels in, let the AI generate what it thinks you want, and it does it very, very accurately in many cases. This is a really tall, I think I did a 16 by nine composition. Let's go ahead and just crop it down a little bit to get rid of a few things that it added in. Maybe tighten up this. I've got now this super tall vertical composition that wasn't there. All of it wasn't there. Now in my image, all of these pixels were there. All I did was blend them together. In this image, it actually added part of this stick together. And in that process, I showed you before, it, it, it gets the light right. It gets, it gets the colors right. It's really, really impressive. So generative fill is a big deal. I think it does have an application in wildlife. I want to show you what I'm scared about. And this is a preface to what's coming up next. Now, this image is not my image. This image is by one of my patrons, Daniel Gomez. Just a terrific human. Uh, we were playing around with editing. We were playing around with this bokeh up top. Um, and this was an edit that, that he really liked and I really liked as well. But what, what if one day Daniel says, hey, you know what would have been cooler is if this vermilion flycatcher was looking at something on the end of this branch. So I'm going to make a little selection here at the end of the branch. And notice that generative fill option came up again. I'm going to click on that. And now I'm going to put, oh, what's a cool insect? Well, not much cooler than a praying mantis. So let's see what happens when I put in generate a praying mantis. No praying mantis in this image. It's now going to go outside the image, figure out what a praying mantis is, what it should look like, and it's going to put it on that stick. Here's, the, here's where the AI is powerful. It's not just going to put it floating in midair. It's not going to put a cartoon. It's going to match the light. And it's probably even going to get it to perch on that stick. If I did it right, if I selected enough of that stick. Now, I did play around with a couple of these generations before. Look at this. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. Look at the feet. The feet are grabbing a stick. I'll, I'll take it off. The stick wasn't there. The stick that this is grabbing wasn't there. It filled it in and it matched the textures and the light. The angle of the light matches. I don't like that pose. What about this one? Uh, he doesn't look supernatural. He's kind of standing off the stick too much. Maybe this one's better. Nah, that one's looking away. Well, let's just generate three more. I mean, maybe I don't like any of them. Generate three more. Part two. <laughs> you see, you probably see where I'm going to part two. How much skill's involved here? Now, in the past, you could Photoshop this stuff. It took a little bit of skill. How much skill's involved in this? Tell it what you want to do and let it do it for you. Where are we going with AI? So this generative fill... Listen, I think there's a, an application for wildlife photographers. I think some of the applications are just going to be faster for you. If you're, if you're using it kind of like content-aware fill, 
adding, you know, maybe you're, you, you didn't get your composition right. You want to add a few pixels here or there. You want to remove a distraction. The integrity of the image is the same. My philosophy, just so everybody knows, because I've been clear with this in the past, is I am not a perfectionist in ter or a purist in terms of photography, digital photography, being exactly what the camera captured. Uh, my intent is to create things that I can hang on the wall. So I treat it more like somebody who was doing touch-ups for a magazine. You know, we're going to remove blemishes. We're going to, if there's a tick on a bird's face, it's coming off in my image. I'm telling you, it's coming off. Uh, if I have to alter the light a little bit, I'm fine with doing that. If I change the hues a little bit, I'm fine with doing that. If I take away a little stick that was there, I'm fine doing that. The integrity of the image has to be pure, though. It has to be the scene that was there that day. I'm not going to add anything in. This is something I would never do. I would never add the praying mantis in. However, how many people will? Well, we're going to explore that in part two, but I hope you enjoyed this kind of introduction to generative fill, especially as it pertains to wildlife photography. Two applications that I find works really well as a removal tool, very simple to use, doesn't take a lot of skill. The other part is generating pixels to fill in, whether you're expanding a canvas or even stitching together a few things. Um, it does a really, really nice job of putting those together. Down in the comments, if you've played around with it, where have you noticed the applications? Now let's avoid the adding to, the inserting of other things. We'll save that for, for the second part of this video. But uh, just in terms of editing, is there an application here that's really, really powerful that I haven't explored yet because it's a young technology? Um, and well, are you scared? We'll get into more of that on part two, but I want to thank you for your support on the channel. If you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button down there, little bell for notifications, click on that. It'll let you know when I have a new video out. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for your support on the channel. And every time I'll say it, I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.